Hey everyone, welcome back. Thanks for your time. In this video, I'm going to go back to the Orion Heat Shield investigation that wrapped up in early December and the press conference that followed it. An interesting detail, well, at least to me, was that a couple of weeks after that, one of the base heat shield Charlos events was specifically identified in the onboard video of the Artemis 1 spacecraft's re-entry at the end of the mission. Knowing what frame to look for, I was curious about where it was in the video, but also where it was within the re-entry profile itself. So here's a little deep dive into that. Over the year-end holidays, the Space Agency published a story about the work that the NASA Engineering and Safety Center did to assist in the Orion Base Heat Shield investigation. The NESE assisted the Artemis I char loss team that investigated the unexplained events that occurred during Orion's return from the moon at the end of the mission on December 11, 2022. Following recovery of the Orion crew module, NASA found unexpected char loss on the base heat shield, first noting that in March 2023 and that they were investigating. After two years of investigation and internal reviews, in December 2024, NASA reported that those post-flight inspections found more than 100 locations on the heat shield with char loss. The NESC story included a frame of the onboard re-entry video that showed one of the instances of char loss. The video wasn't new, but correlating one of the char liberation events in the video was and we can see additional instances of that in the same period of time in that onboard re-entry video. Amit Shatriya, the head of the Moon to Mars program office within NASA's Exploration Directorate, talked about how the Avcoat ablative material is supposed to work in the press conference on December 5, 2024, that announced the findings and decisions that NASA made as a result of the investigation. He also explained why the investigation took so long. Let's take a look at that. We saw variations in the condition of the heat shield which, in which the char, the char layer that protects Orion um, broke off in ways we did not expect. We observed about 100 spots across the heat shield where that phenomenon occurred. Um, charring is normal ablator behavior during entry. The way that energy is dissipated, all of the energy we put into the spacecraft um, at, at launch has to be has to be reduced so we have a safe and, and nominal landing. Most of that energy when we when we enter the atmosphere at that speed is rejected by the by the um, radiative shock uh, that occurs in front of the vehicle as, it, as it's transiting through the atmosphere. Some of that is rejected uh, via convection through the through the through the outer layer of the heat shield. It is normal behavior for the ablator that it's that it's built on Orion to char. The heat shield is, however, is not designed to liberate those pieces of char. Uh, instead, an, a char layer and an ablator is supposed to recede gradually. Uh, so the underlying material insulates the spacecraft from the high heat flux we experience during entry. As I mentioned, uh, the performance was excellent, but, but that char loss is outside of the design intent. Now, just because our bond line temperatures were within four factors of safety, just because our guidance was right down the middle, just because we had the right amount of virgin APCO material left, um, it, is, it is tempting to believe that that means the spacecraft performed the right thing and it performed it with margin. But everything we've learned in our history tells us that, that that's not what margin means. We have to have an absolute technical understanding of the transport and liberation phenomena that led to that uh, loss of char. And so that is why we, we took the, the level of steps that we did to analyze this, this, uh, this issue. Um, so the, the Orion program stood up uh, heat shield tiger team to determine root cause corrective actions and, and, and to start thinking about what that technical truth needs to be. Uh, that team was a multidisciplinary team of experts and TPS systems, aerothermal dynamics, thermal testing analysis, stress analysis, material tests, all across the board. And, and as we as we continued throughout the investigation, we brought in experts uh, from the Department of Defense, from the Department of Energy, across industries across the United States, and even internationally, to help us understand uh, that we were doing the, the, the later behavior because this is cutting edge technology in terms of the way we're, we're exposing these environments. Uh, to make sure that we were using the best of what, what, what um, the country could offer to analyze this. So NASA also published a summary and overview of the findings. For the root cause of the problem, NASA said, quote, 
Engineers determined as Orion was returning from its uncrewed mission around the moon, gases generated inside the heat shield's ablative outer material called Avcoat were not able to vent and dissipate as expected. This allowed pressure to build up and cracking to occur, causing some charred material to break off in several locations." Unquote. Going back to that year-end NESC story, that piece and the annual report of the NESC's technical activities in 2024 included a frame of the re-entry video with a note that this frame showed one of the instances of char loss during the re-entry. NASA had previously released the re-entry video on the one-year anniversary of Orion's return, so that release was on December 11, 2023. If we go through that video, we find that frame just before the 15-minute mark. NASA did not provide much detail about what happened during the two years of investigation, but one of the qualitative notes they provided during one of the few media briefings was that they saw many of the char loss events after the pull-up from the skip re-entry profile that was flown. I went over this previously in a video ahead of the heat shield press conference. The skip re-entry includes an initial descent into the atmosphere, but then uses the lifting characteristics of the crew module shape, which was copied from the Apollo command module. It uses that shape to fly a little ways up and back out of the dense atmosphere before making a second and final entry. We see that in this altitude versus distance graph from a NASA paper on the performance of Orion's flight control system during the Artemis I re-entry. In particular, the Guidance, Navigation, and Control, or GNC, performance. The table at the bottom here shows that the spacecraft began that up control period after descending for a little more than 100 seconds from entry interface at 400,000 feet altitude. In a little more than a minute and a half, it descended down from 400,000 feet to 200,000 feet before using the lift of the spacecraft to ascend back to almost 300,000 feet altitude. About six and a half minutes after that pull-up started, Orion began the second phase of the re-entry at about 250,000 feet, a few minutes after the flight control system transitioned back to a ballistic trajectory. That skip in the re-entry trajectory allows Orion to more precisely control its landing location from a variety of different entry interfaces. NASA typically wants to land off the coast of San Diego. The skip re-entry makes for a more precise landing zone, but as this piece by Lockheed Martin, the Orion Prime contractor, published at the time of the Artemis I mission notes, it also splits up the heat and force of the re-entry, which reduces the peak G-forces on the crew and the heat flux on the heat shield and spacecraft. Given that frame that was noted in the NESC publications, if we look at an excerpt of the onboard re-entry video, slowed down around that 15 minute mark, we can see multiple char loss events in what looks like the period where Orion is once again dipping back into the atmosphere for its final entry. That NASA paper on Orion GNC says that the forward bay cover pilot chute deploy was at entry interface plus 950 seconds. So if we eyeball, or earball, that mortar firing sound, and we also have to assume this video is contiguous or unedited through the entry, then entry interface is at approximately 233 seconds into the video. If we start a stopwatch there, we see some of those events in the table, beginning immediately with the first roll. We can hear the Orion Crew Module's Reaction Control System, or RCS jets, firing to start that roll. You can see the plasma build up within 20 seconds of entry interface. It gets more intense before a minute passes. And then Orion GNC begins to fly the skip a little more than a minute and a half after entry interface. 
Then we see transitioning to the ballistic phase at 256 seconds after EI. Then the final entry phase begins at 551 seconds after EI, and we see that frame in the NESC publications showing the char loss event would roughly correspond to approximately 661 seconds after entry interface. That's just over 11 minutes after that, and a little less than 7 minutes after the spacecraft had performed the skip and transitioned to the ballistic phase of entry. As was noted in the announcement and publication of summary findings of the Orion Heat Shield investigation, that time in between the two atmospheric entries during the skip was when the pressure built up in the heat shield and led to the char loss events, some of which we see at this point in this onboard camera video of the re-entry. The NASA published summary of the findings of the investigation noted that the investigation team, quote, observed that during the period between dips into the atmosphere, heating rates decreased and thermal energy accumulated inside the heat shield's avcoat material. This led to the accumulation of gases that are part of the expected ablation process. Because the avcoat did not have the permeability, internal pressure built up and led to cracking and uneven shedding of the outer layer." Unquote. Here's how Mr. Shatria described it in the press conference. The, the issue is that during re-entry, uh, the, we have, there is a, as, as I mentioned, the, the ablative material has to produce um, those, those gases under pyrolysis. And pyrolysis is just burning without oxygen. We learned that as part of that reaction, the permeability of the EPCO material is essential. Um, and this is something that did not necessarily produce itself in our reconstruction of the data until we looked at the, the regions where the recession of that char layer were, what was, was arrested and that the recession was arrested during the dwell time during the skip reentry. During that period, the production of those gases was higher than the permeability could tolerate. And so as a result, pressure, a pressure differential was created. The, that pressure led to cracks in plane with the outer mold line of the vehicle. And as in certain areas of the vehicle where, that, where those cracks propagated to the bond line of the blocks, uh, the char was then liberated. We um, were able to determine this correlation and connection between um, those, um, that, that, that permeability because actually during Artemis one, it turns out that some, per, some small percentage of the, of the Artemis one heat shield what actually exhibited a phenomenon of, of permeability that we that we were actually shooting for now in our in our corrective action, but but the the acreage of the heat shield was not uniform in terms of its permeability. There were places where it was actually more permeable than than the rest, a small percentage, and in those places we did not witness in plane cracking, and that was the key clue for us. So we're able to to take that and then and then reproduce in in multiple different environments and multiple different um, facilities that, that the generation of those cracks in the environment uh, under which those cracks would, would, would exist. For Artemis II, NASA decided to fly that heat shield as is, so they are limiting the downrange distance from entry interface to the splashdown target area to 1,775 nautical miles, basically taking most of the skip out of the trajectory. For reference, the Artemis 1 skip re-entry provided 3,176 nautical miles of range, and Mr. Shatria noted in the December press conference that anything under about 1,300 nautical miles of range is essentially a fully ballistic re-entry. NASA and Orion Prime contractor Lockheed Martin are already building a new set of AVCO blocks with the new specifications for permeability, and those will be bonded to the base heat shield carrier structures for the Artemis 3 and 4 spacecraft after production of the blocks is complete and they are shipped to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative.